the only shooting stick with one-handed trigger pull adjustments, has a new way to keep you at the top of your game. The Trigger Stick Apex, built for sturdy support that adapts to unforgiving terrain with easy adjustments to make your big shots. With our Durasteady three-piece carbon leg design and interchangeable rock-solid clamp, nothing tops the Apex. The Trigger Stick Apex, only from Primo's. At Midway USA, we know the AR-15 is one of the most popular rifles in modern American history. Known for its modularity and widespread use, it's often considered essential to any gun collection. The essential things you need to run an AR-15 are usually always in stock during shortages, things like magazines and 5.56 ammo. Whether you're looking to buy a new AR-15 or buy parts for your modern sporting rifle, log on and for just about everything for the outdoors, shop MidwayUSA.com. Welcome to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. I'm Matthew of castingacross.com, where I explore the quarry and culture of fly fishing. Thank you for downloading and listening. Today we're going to talk about things you don't need. Things you don't need in fly fishing. Now, here's the caveat. If you want them, get them. I have pretty much all these things. Let me do three things. I have two of the three. So don't feel like this is going to be some sort of dogmatic denouncement of particular pieces of gear that you may have an affinity for. This is simply some things that if you are getting started in fly fishing or you've been fishing for a while and you've thought about picking up, maybe I can give you a little bit of perspective. But before I get to that, I just wanted to, again, a express appreciation for everyone who listens to the podcast. It's been a, a nice, robust audience as of late. And so I, I appreciate that. And as well as everybody who has been uh, reaching out via email and through social media with questions and comments. Uh, in particular, uh, as I'll mention here at the end of the podcast, have had m more emails uh, than, than I've gotten in recent memory about a particular article that I put out and that I've talked about on the podcast. So uh, uh, stay tuned for that and you can figure out why people are just clamoring to get in touch with me and you might as well. So three things that you, you don't need when you are fly fishing. Now there's absolutely more than three. Uh, and in fact, uh, there was the initial thought for this podcast was three things that you probably don't have, but you need for fly fishing. But I've done some podcasts like that before. And so I'll, I'll table that one for now. Uh, but I'm going to talk about three things that you do not need. Now, when it comes down to it for fly fishing, you really only need a few things. You need a rod, you need a reel, you need line, you need tippet, and you need flies. And you can catch fish with that. But of course, you're going to run into situations where you realize, you know what, it's good to have multiple spools of tippet at different diameters. It's good to have a few different leaders in case you run into a problem or into diverse situations. If you fish in, in more than one location or that one location in where which you fish uh, presents different situations for you, you might want another rod and getting another rod may necessitate getting another reel, another line. If the water's high, you need waders, you need boots, and you need a hat, you need sunglasses, you need all of these things, all the tools that go along with it, all the little stuff. Now, again, I keep saying the word need. And of course, there's a difference between the capital and need, which is those first initial things I mentioned, the rod, reel, line, tippet, and flies, and the lowercase n need, waders and boots and some of those essential tools. And one of the, the I think, criticisms that can be very accurate and, and well-deserved for fly fishing is that it is an activity that requires all of this stuff. And if you open a fly fishing catalog, you can quickly become overwhelmed with all the options out there. But let me tell you, as someone who's been doing this for, goodness, 25 years now, which I know there's maybe some of you been doing it for twice as long as that, I look at those catalogs and I think, my goodness, look at all this stuff. I have a lot of this stuff and I don't use a lot of this stuff, but every once in a while you find something that you really, really enjoy, makes your life easier, makes your time on the water faster. And in my experience, it's not the things that comes in at a super high price tag. But what I'm going to talk about today is three items, again, that are sometimes seen as essential or seen as necessary, but honestly, you could do very well for quite a while 
without using them, okay? First one, a net, a net. Now, hear me out. You might be saying, what? You need the net because how else can you get the fish in hand and do all those things? Let me explain myself. Here's here's the, the, the initial caveat. If you want a net, carry a net, all right? <laughs> like I said, I carry a net probably half the time I go fishing. Uh, so I have no problem with a net. I only own two nets. Of all of the gear that I have, like the wide variety of stuff that I own, I only have two nets. One was the very first net that I bought uh, years ago when I was probably 16. And uh, I took a bad spill uh, on a stream bank and I cracked it. And so it is duct taped. It's been duct taped with the same duct tape for probably 20 years now. Uh, but uh, I have an, a really nice uh, Broden net that my wife got me for an anniversary years and years ago that I carry. Now, why am I saying you don't need a net? A lot of times you don't need a net because you are catching fish that don't need to be netted. Uh, so you're fishing high mountain streams. You don't need a net for that to catch, to, to pull a little brook trout in close to, to hand and to get your hand wet, grab it and quickly uh, take the hook out of its mouth. If you're fishing in a stream for kind of average sized fish, that 12, 14, 16 inch trout, and you are wading, you know, waist deep or knee deep, all you got to do is pull that fish into you and, you know, quickly with your forceps or with, with your fingers, grab that fly and give a quick flick. And if it's a barbless hook, it's going to come right out. Um, if you're fishing for a uh, warm water fish, I can't remember the last time I used a net on a bass. I'm not saying it's inappropriate or you, you can't do it, but I oftentimes just lip those fish. Or even if it's something that could potentially be a little bit painful, like a pickerel or something like that, I just grab it around uh, its its fins and uh, and deal with it that way. So I carry a net when I am in a couple different situations. One, and when I'm on a really big river where the current is fast and even a small fish is going to potentially get out in the current and have that second wind. And I carry the, the, the net for the fish's sake, not my sake. So it, if it gets close enough, I can quickly get a hold of it and uh, get the hook out and get the thing swimming again. It doesn't get back out into the current and have an opportunity to run more and potentially tire itself out. Uh, I would say a corollary to that is there could be big fish. And every once in a while, I do catch a big fish. And it's nice to have that net to be able to admire it. Is that necessary? Is that uh, absolutely something that you have to have? No, but I, I will use it in those situations. Another situation is when I am on a smaller spring creek or a, a, sm a creek where I'm on the banks. So a lot of the spring creeks that I fish, they're just not worth waiting uh, for, for one. Uh, it is super silty and muddy and it is not fun to wade. Uh, secondly, it is uh, not the best way to present your fly and get into the right position. Uh, so I will carry a net because if I'm landing fish, I'm it's not super convenient to lean over the bank and take that fly out of that fish's mouth. It's easier to net it and deal with it in a little bit more contained manner. Once again, you, so you can appreciate the fish, but also it makes it better for the fish and for probably your gear. Um, but with that said, I've had as many flies come out of fish's mouth as I have netted them as I have by just reaching down and flicking the fly out of the mouth. Again, if you're using barbless hooks, uh, as soon as that line goes slack, whether it's as you're netting the fish or because you make a mistake when you're fighting that fish, there's a good chance that that uh, fly will come out. And so that's why proper fish fighting techniques are so important. So all that to say, the net is not necessary. Now, if you want to carry one for insurance, go for it. But does it need to be a $400 net? No. Does it need to be a net with a six foot long handle? If you're fishing for trout, I don't think so. Uh, if you have a boat, then that makes sense. If you are catching fish to keep and eat, then carry a net because you, that's what you're going for. You're going to have that fish in your hands. But under a lot of normal trout fishing situations uh, where I've been out west, where I have been down south, where I have been here in the mid-Atlantic and in New England, I just don't feel like I have to carry a net. And when I do, it's usually a smaller net. And even a smaller net can be very effective at catching a 20-inch fish if you are fighting that fish properly. If you're having to jab at that fish with the net uh, and, and you're wishing you had a longer net or a wider net, then there is a chance, not 
under all circumstances, not under all situations, but there is a chance that you're not employing proper fish fighting techniques, or maybe you are trying to net the fish prematurely. So again, a lot of broad brush statements, but all that to say, nets are good, nets are fine, you just don't need a net, and you certainly don't need a top of the line, fancy, fancy net. All right, that's the first thing. Second one is one that maybe you have never uh, thought you needed. Uh, and especially if you've been fishing for decades, this might not even be something that you are aware is is out there. But you do not need an app to tell you where and when to catch fish. You do not need an app. You do not need a website subscription. You do not need some sort of digital tool to tell you where and when to catch fish. Now, I am not above using technology in, in my outdoor pursuits. As I mentioned a number of times on the podcast and on the website, there's some apps that I think are absolutely fun and helpful. A lot of them have mapping features. A lot of them have weather uh, and, and stream flow data that I, I lean on. But I have never used, well, let me take that back. I have never consistently used. I've been asked to try a few things out, and I've given a few things uh, a couple of, of attempts. But I've never really stuck with any app or website or online service that purports to tell you where to catch fish, when to catch fish, how to catch fish, and what I find particularly uh, uh, distasteful. Then this is personal. I'm not saying this is this is for everybody, but for me, I don't really want to know how many other people have been catching fish in the streams that I want to fish in. Uh, it's not that I'm burying my head in my sand. It's just I, I have very little interest in knowing that. Um, it might lead to you know what they call the FOMO, fear of missing out, knowing that somebody caught a big fish where I'm going to fish tomorrow uh, is 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 not great. But at the end of the day, it's just not something that I'm interested in uh, and, and spending my time or my money on. So why why am I saying this? Well. First of all, if you need an app or a website or an online service to tell you when the best time of day and where to catch fish is, first of all, you probably have the kind of flexibility where you are fishing enough and you're able to fish when you want to fish, where you want to fish, where you should figure that out on your own. So let me kind of rephrase that. If an app says fish at 10 a.m. tomorrow and you're able to say, all right, I'm fishing at 10 a.m. tomorrow or fish with this pattern in this particular place. And you can say, all right, I can go buy that and I can go do that thing. Then you have the kind of flexibility where I would just encourage you to figure it out on your own, especially because what the information that you will be receiving is isn't 100 percent accurate and it's just somebody else's opinion and it might be based on barometer it might might be um based on the sun or the lunar phase it might be based on the tide all of those things but all that data is something that you can access for free and that everybody should be paying attention to uh generally speaking uh when you go fishing so if you kind of have that flexibility where you're able to go fish kind of at the beck and call of an app or a website then you probably can and will figure it out on your own. Now, if you don't have the kind of time and flexibility that I'm talking about, if you're saying, you know what, I'm only going to fish every once in a while, so I'm going to get an app or a website or something where I, it's really going to help me find exactly where I want to go, then you you probably shouldn't be relying on that app. And you, what are you going to do if you say, oh, I've got this one Saturday this month to go fishing and you look on the app and it, it you know, it's got the little meter and it's down in the, the, the cool zone and it, it shows your, your catch probability is very low or says go fish in the morning, but you only have time in the afternoon. Are you going to not fish? And I would say the answer is no. And fish are going to get caught any day of the year and they're going to get caught in virtually every weather situation and they're going to be caught in any style of fishing that you want to fish in as long as your presentation is appropriate and the conditions uh, align relatively speaking so i am not saying that these apps are bad uh i just think that their main selling points uh giving me uh pinpoint information about where, how, when to fish, and showing where other people have been doing the same, it's not the kind of thing that I feel like I need to invest money in. And I don't think you need to feel like you need to either. Uh, the marketing for a lot of these things says, you know, this will help you catch more fish. I uh, maybe, 
I'm not going to say it isn't, but I also don't think it is a surefire bet. I think a lot of times what can happen then is you, you can fall into the same uh, trap that you could fall into if you said, well, I went on this stream uh, last week using this fly and cast in this way and I caught a bunch of fish. And so you come back a week later and you try to replicate that and conditions have changed slightly or the fish are just being critters and they're doing something different and or there could be a variable that you don't even see or understand or or or, or feel and uh, the fishing isn't the same or or not just last week but last year um i i feel like websites and apps can lead you down that path of just relying on uh, uh anecdotal data rather than uh, uh, observational data if that makes sense so Again, I have no problem with these things existing. I don't think they're bad. I just have not found them particularly useful. I prefer to have the data in front of me and to interact with it plus my experience rather than kind of having that uh, curated for me into something that uh, I'm, I might not be seeing the entire picture. So number one is net. Number two is app. Uh, number three is not three letters, but it is the third one. And here it is, nippers. You do not need nippers. Now you might say, Matthew, I have been listening to Casting Across. I have looked at your website. You have only a handful of YouTube videos up, but a couple of them have to do with nippers. Well, here's the thing. I want to carry nippers pretty much all the time. I think they are great. I think they are helpful for making precision cuts and simple cuts of line and leader and tippet. I usually don't use them on my line. Let me retract that. But a leader and tippet. Um, I use it for that terminal knot when I tie my tippet to my fly. I use it for all of my joining knots when I'm building leaders up. I like to have that nice sharp edge and to be able to have that pinpoint accuracy in a tiny little package, as well as virtually every pair of nippers I own has a little point for taking a uh, the, the gunk out of the eye of a hook. So I think nippers are great and I carry them all the time, but to be very, very honest, you don't need nippers. You don't. Um, a much more helpful tool, if you want a tool that is is going to do more for you than having a pair of nippers and something else, is getting a pair of quality scissor forceps. Um, if you don't want a bunch of stuff, you don't want a bunch of tools, then you can get a pair of scissor forceps and they are going to do anything and everything that nippers do I would say not as efficiently, but as effectively. So what I mean by that is that, you know, scissor forceps, the, the very uh, end of the nose is going to have just the clamping uh, portion, which is great for clamping down barbs, for, um, you know, pulling the f hook out of the fish's mouth, for doing all the little things that you need a little bit more precision than uh, than your fingertips can can provide for you. But then as you move up those jaws, it turns into scissors. Some of them I have are kind of uh, serrated and some of them are, are um, just, just kind of flat and sharp. Uh, but these function just like scissors do. And the nice thing about them is the the cutting portion is right at that hinge point that, uh, of those of those forceps, so you don't need to apply a lot of pressure. Now, why are they not as um, efficient as nippers? They're not as efficient because it is that that um, scissoring motion, a, a, as you were, uh, where they they are going to be cutting from one end to the other. So they could potentially push something out of the way if they are not sharp or if the material that you're using is thicker. Uh, secondly, uh, you are going to be doing it from the side as opposed to straight on. So you think about when you use nippers on a fly, you think your fly and nippers are basically moving um, against each other, whereas uh, forceps with scissors in them and the fly are moving perpendicular to each other. And so you're not going to have the same... Uh, ease of precision if you're using scissor forceps. So that's me being an apologist for carrying nippers. But if you've said, you know, this is ridiculous, people paying $100 for nippers, people paying $20 for nippers, people carrying nippers, then I am in agreement. You don't need to do it. If I am being very minimalistic, I will leave my nippers at home and just pair, carry a good pair of scissor forceps. I would say that scissor forceps uh, are, or forceps in, in general, 
are an essential tool to have because of the usefulness of dislodging a hook, particularly if a fish is hooked very, very well or a fish is hooked deep. At that point, having one little thing dangling off of your pack or on your pocket or wherever is worth carrying because it means that you're able to quickly um, and and smartly remove a hook from a fish. And that that's worth it. And the $10 tool is worth it if you're going to uh, reduce the fish mortality. But you don't need to carry this, nippers. Um, I do. I don't need to. And like I said, there's times when I don't. So three items. One is not really an item. One's a thing, uh, an app. But nets, good, not necessary. Uh, apps, okay, certainly not necessary. Nippers, really good. I like them a lot, but not necessary. So hopefully this is helpful for you. And think about not just the, the, the specifics of what I talked about, uh, not just the, the objects of the net or the app or the nippers. Uh, when you go to make that next purchase, when you go to put that next piece of gear on your wish list, uh, then contemplate, uh, you know, if, if you found any value in this, kind of my reasoning of, of is this worth carrying? Is the cost benefit ratio uh, worth it if you are on a budget? Um, if you are a, a minimalist, uh, is this something that absolutely has to take up space in your pack? Uh, whether you're doing it because you don't like to carry a lot of bulky stuff or you're backpacking and so you just don't want that weight. Uh, think about not just the specifics of those three items, but also the, uh, the, the reasoning that got me to that place. And again, I carry the two of these three things uh, over half the time I fish. Uh, the third one, I don't really don't mess with at all. So I'm not saying that these are bad or if you carry them, there's a problem uh, because nets are great and nippers are really great. Um, and so if you use them, then use them. If you have uh, an objection, if you have an accusation saying, I can't believe it. If you're part of big net uh, and, and you uh, you think, you know what, you're missing out, missing out on something important, then let me know. Matthew at castingacross.com. I would love to hear it. This week on castingacross.com, there was three articles. The first one, uh, going all the way back to Monday, all the way back to Monday, was called Ms. May and Trout Calendars. Ms. May and Trout Calendars. So I got my uh, Trout Unlimited calendar, uh, I think, on Friday of this last week. And so I looked at it all weekend. It's actually sitting on my, my desk right here in front of me. And I've been getting Trout Unlimited calendars for as long as I've been fly fishing. I think I got a free TU membership with something that I did as a teenager, and I've kept it active ever since. And so getting these TU calendars every fall uh, has been just a, a rite of autumn. Uh, and he, what I immediately do is open up and start flipping through. And they have reduced the quality of the paper, and they say it is for ecological reasons. I think there's some things, if we can be very honest with them and with you, that are worth just sticking with a nice, high-quality uh, uh, paper. They could send me less uh, you know, membership uh, drive stuff, and they could save a lot of money on paper that way, if, uh, if I'm going to be uh, very blunt. But uh, my bigger gripe, and this is all... This is like all low level stuff. This is me having to talk about stuff, and write about stuff. That's why I'm doing this. But I've thought about it before. There's very few pictures of fish in the Trout Unlimited calendar anymore. Um, there's pictures of people fishing. Like, I don't mind a person that's in a background, that, that's in a landscape, because that's kind of cool and you can pretend that that's you. But like a close up of somebody fishing is really not what I want to see for 31 days. Um, and honestly, there are so many beautiful fish and so many subspecies and strains of some of our American uh, fish uh, trout species that you could easily fill up a a not just a 14 month calendar but a 28 month calendar you could you could probably with with very little effort and I think I wrote this in the article make a fish a day calendar and you could you could easily wow people with every page turn. I understand what TU is doing. And again, I am not going to cancel my membership or write a letter to the president uh, or anything like that because of this observation. I just would like to go back to prettier paper and prettier fish. So let me know what you think about that. If you agree or disagree, I've had a couple people write in and uh, everyone's agreed so far. So whatever, whatever that's worth. All right. And then Wednesday's article is called Bad Fish, Competing and Cheating. I haven't talked about tournament angling much on Casting Across, but the short of it is this. 
I'm not a huge fan, but I'm also not um, like uh, antagonistic towards it. I'm not against it, particularly like bass fishing. I grew up watching uh, Bassmaster every Saturday morning, and uh, I, I, I understand and appreciate the fun that comes with it and just how it changes fishing. Uh, that being said, there was a walleye tournament that you've probably heard about because it's made mainstream news. And as I mentioned sometime in the last few weeks, uh, anytime that fishing and fish makes mainstream news, it's worth paying attention to to see how other people are talking about it, people who aren't kind of invested in this culture. And this walleye cheating scandal uh, rocked the the world. Well, I mean, the grand scheme of things, what's going on today, it's not that big of a deal. But uh, there, the, there was a video that went viral, and that's probably what made it uh, so interesting. So I got a link to that video uh, and just a couple of words about this walleye tournament cheating scandal. And uh, you can check that out uh, on castingacross.com. This week's recommendation is trout and feather, especially the latest uh Pursuit of Fish blog that I wrote for Tim Camisa's Trout and Feather. And I mentioned this a few weeks ago and it went live, but uh, this, as I alluded to at the very beginning of the podcast, has generated more email to me than I have received about any one particular article uh, in recent memory. It's probably going back a few years to something controversial and not to something just kind of positive. And the reason why is because I asked for book recommendations from people. And I've asked for that before, but now with a wider audience through Trout and Feather, uh, I have a whole new group of people that are chiming in saying, you definitely need to read this. You should check this out. See if you can find this in a secondhand bookstore. Uh, This is out of print, but if you ever see it, you should buy it. And I absolutely love that stuff. Talk about not needing gear anymore. Uh, I, I don't need a lot of gear, but I always could use more books. And so uh, definitely if you are interested in building an angling library, then check out that article on Trout and Feather. And if you are an a avid reader then in, or an author and you have something that you think that I should read and add to my growing catalog of books on the website that I recommend, then let me know. Matthew at castingacross.com. So that's my recommendation for this week. Even if you just have a favorite book that you read 20 years ago and you've read it a few times or something that you just read that you think, oh man, this book is great. Uh, he should know about it. Let me know. Matthew at castingacross.com. I always appreciate any and all uh, recommendations for reading materials. Thanks for listening to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. Please subscribe in your favorite podcast app and then rate the podcast on iTunes. Then head over to castingacross.com for three posts a week on the people, places, and things that go into the pursuit of fish. In Wild Country, rules were not created by man. Don't miss Wild Country, Wednesdays from 7 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Presented by Primos. Speak the language. Waypoint TV, the destination for outdoor entertainment. A life that has the stories to back it. A life to be proud of. It's a Winchester life. Yeah, baby. 6 8 Western. Oh, I'll be over there, baby, right there. Tune in every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern on Waypoint TV.